Good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning, good morning, won't you share with a friend or two? Good morning, good morning to you, you. Good morning, good morning to you and many more. Good morning, good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome to Daring Dialogues Black Table Talk Edition. Let me first start out by apologizing to my podcast listeners because I forgot to podcast last week's initial session. So we are on part two of Hoodoo Origins and Understandings. We are not going to be backtracking. We are going to reiterate some things that we began in part one. So you'll kind of hear a little bit of reiteration today. Um, but for the most part, we are moving forward because we have a lot to cover. Again, this is part two of a part four of four part series. And we're going to get started in just a moment. There will be an opportunity, hopefully towards the end, um, for those of you who may want to come in and chop it up a little bit about what we've covered on today. If we have time, we will certainly drop the link into the chat for you. Take a moment to go ahead and share this broadcast out. I am Shante Charles. I am your host and your lecturer for today. So hopefully um, I will try to figure out how to get the part one uploaded for our podcast listeners. But today, again, this is part two of Hoodoo Origins and Understanding. I am going to be making myself a little small in the corner so that we can get a really good view of today's uh, lecture. So let me go ahead and do that now. And I'm going to become very, very little. Thank you for tuning in, those of you who are here with us. Good morning, good morning, good morning. A pleasure to be amongst the living. I hope everybody is having a great and wonderful day. All right, let's hop on in. I'm going to be trying to look for comments and pay attention a little bit to the comments um, in my comment section through my phone. So if I see a comment, good morning, if I see a comment that um, sparks something, I will try to address that comment as we are moving along here. But we do have a lot more to cover than we started in part one. So let us hop right into it. Again, this is Daring Dialogues Black Table Talk Edition. It is Hoodoo Heritage Month and we are learning together today about Hoodoo origins and understanding. Good morning, good morning, good morning. All right. So hope you got your pens ready. Hope you got your thinking caps on. And let us rumble. All right. So when we last left off, we were talking about um, the Kakongo people, the Bukongo people, and the Central African influence that is a part of hoodoo, a part of understanding what hoodoo is, how hoodoo came to be, what its origin story is. Cult cultural anthropologist Tony Kale conducted research in African-American communities in Memphis, Tennessee, and traced the origins of hoodoo practices to Central Africa. In Memphis, Kale interviewed black root workers and wrote about African-American hoodoo practices and history in his book, A Secret History of Memphis Hoodoo. 
For example, Kale recorded at former slave plantations in the American South, the beliefs and practices of African traditional religions survived the Middle Passage, the transatlantic slave trade, and were preserved among the many root workers and healers throughout the South. Many of them served as healers, counselors, and pharmacists to the enslaved during the hardships of enslavement. Yes, our community had some of the first pharmacists in the United States. A unique spiritual practice. P. Sterling Stuckey was a professor of American history who specialized in the study of American slavery and African-American slave culture and history in the United States. He asserted that African culture in America developed into a unique African-American spiritual and religious practice that was foundational for conjure black theology and liberation movements. The evidence can be found also in enslaved narratives. It can be found in African-American quilts. It can be found in black churches and the continued pra cultural practices of African-Americans. Yes, yes, and more yes. It can be found in all of those places. So let's talk, as we talked about last week, I wanted us to learn about the Congo Cosmogram. Now I found this to be amazing. I found it to be fascinating. And I'm gonna blow this up so you can see it a little bit better. And let's just swing my screen so that you can just see the Cosmogram itself. There we go. All right, take a look at that. This is from the Bakongo people. It is their cosmogram. It is how they visualized, symbolically visualized what they saw was the world based on the seasons, fall, summer, winter, and spring. Notice how their, their image is going counterclockwise. So going from summer, which represents birth, fall, which represents maturity, winter representing death, and conception representing spring. So if you, if you think about the circle of life, this is how the Bakongo people see it. Also, you have the physical world, or Nseke, and the spiritual world, or Pemba. If you look here, they believed that there was a separation by water, represented by the Kalunga River, between the physical world and you transitioning over into the spiritual world. And they know, if you notice, for the spiritual world, they believe that the spiritual world carries death and it also carries conception. Okay, so let's take a look at what this all means. The Bakongo origins in hoodoo practice are evident. Ancient Congolese spiritual beliefs and practices are present in hoodoo, such as the Congo cosmogram. The basic form is a simple cross with one line. The Congo cosmogram symbolizes the rising of the sun in the east and the setting of the sun in the west. It represents cosmic energies. The horizontal line in the Congo cosmogram represents the boundary between the physical world, the realm of the living, and the spiritual world, the realm of the ancestors. The vertical line of the cosmogram is the path of spiritual power from God at the top, traveling to the realm of the dead below where the ancestors reside. The cosmogram or the Kenga, however, is not a unitary symbol like a Christian cross or a national flag, right? The physical world resides at the top of the cosmogram the spiritual or the ancestral world resides at the bottom. 
of the cosmogram. At the horizontal line is a watery divide that separates the two worlds from the physical and the spiritual. Thus, the element of water has a role in African-American spirituality. The Congo cosmogram cross symbol has a physical form in hoodoo called the crossroads. You will even hear people like Thug Bones in Harmony, I believe, singing Meet Me at the Crossroads. Uh, where hoodoo rituals are performed to communicate with spirits, to leave ritual remains, to remove a curse. The Congo cosmogram is also spelled the Bakongo cosmogram and the Yawa cross. So if you're looking at symbolism, if you're looking at um, how would I, how do I want to express myself or my spirituality? This is how they are doing it. The Yawa or the Dikenga cross. Now, what's so powerful about this is this symbol makes it all across the United States after the transatlantic slave trade. And through research, people have realized that this is yet another marker of cultural practice being carried on through the horrific details of enslavement. The fact that they would keep, that there's this continuity happening of people who have been enslaved where we know that part of that enslavement process was to break them, right? Part of that enslavement process was to kill the spirit and the soul and the traditions and the practices of a people. And yet, this symbol makes it through. Very powerful. The crossroads is a spiritual supernatural crossroad that symbolizes communication between the worlds of the living and the world of the ancestors. Counterclockwise sacred circle dances in hoodoo are performed to honor ancestral spirits using the sign of the Yahweh cross. Communication with the ancestors is a traditional practice in hoodoo that was brought to the United States during the slave trade originating among Bantu Congo people. In Savannah, Georgia, in the historic African-American church called the First African Baptist Church, which I have been to, the Congo cosmogram symbol was found in the basement of the church. African-Americans had punctured holes in the basement floor of the church to make a diamond-shaped Congo cosmogram for prayer and meditation. The church was also a, top, a stop on the Underground Railroad. The holes in the floor provided breathable air for escaped slaves hiding in the basement of the church. The Congo Cosmogram Sun Cycle also influenced how African-Americans in Georgia prayed. It was recorded that some African-Americans in Georgia prayed at the rising and the setting of the sun. So when you talk about cultural practices, these are not just things that are made up out of nowhere. They came from somewhere, from your descendants, and have been passed down to you, i.e. sunrise service. In an African-American church on the eastern shore of Virginia, Congo cosmograms were designed into the window frames of the church. The church was built facing an axis of an east-west direction, so the sun rises directly over the church steeple in the east. The burial grounds of the church also show continued African-American burial practices of placing mirror-like objects on top of graves. Now, I just want you to pause and calmly think of that. The cosmogram, for those of you who are just coming in, I'm going to show it to you one more time before we move on. Okay, this is the Bakongo cosmogram that was brought over by many of our ancestors. 
Let's see what else it was used for. We know about its spiritual iconography, but it was also used as a marker for safe spaces. Now, if you're a Christian, um, most people recognize the symbol of the fish, right? If you recognize the symbol of the fish, you can type yes, you can put some hearts on the screen, right? So oftentimes, you know, in Christian history, they would say, you know, if somebody wanted to know if the other person was a Christian, they would draw one part of the fish and the other person would finish that fish, right? So it would give an identification that, okay, this is someone who is safe during persecution. Well, for black people, <laughs> the cosmogram was a marker for safe spaces. These artifacts, the Congo Cosmogram artifacts were used as a form of spiritual protection against slavery and for slaves protection during their escape from slavery on the Underground Railroad. Why wouldn't people want you to know this history? I just want you to think about that. It was used as a marker for safe spaces so black people would know where to go. Archaeologists also found the Congo Cosmogram on several plantations in the American South. They were the Richmond Hill Plantation in Georgia, Frogmore Plantation in South Carolina, a plantation in Texas, and Magnolia Plantation in Louisiana. Historians call the locations where these crossroads symbols were possibly found inside of enslaved cabins and African-American living quarters as crossroad deposits. Crossroad deposits were found underneath floorboards and in the northeast sections of cabins to conjure ancestral spirits for protection. Remember, we talked about what conjure means last time, so I'm not going to reiterate. OK. They were asking for their ancestors to help them. Sacrifice animals and other charms were also found where the crossroad symbols were drawn by enslaved Africans and four holes drilled into charms to symbolize the Bakongo cosmogram. Other West Central African traditions found on plantations by historians is the use of the six pointed stars as spiritual symbols. A six pointed star is a symbol in West Africa and in African American spirituality. All right. So let's talk about where is the Congo Cosmogram? Where does it start showing up in art? Both Central and West African symbolism has been observed in African-American quilt making. African-American women made quilts incorporating the Congo Cosmogram and West African crosses. West African crosses. <laughs> Let me emphasize that. For example, an African-American woman named Harriet Powers, if you know anything about art and quilting, you know she's a very well-known figure in the quilting world. Harriet Powers made quilts using Bakanko and other West, West African symbols. On one of her quilts was a cross with four suns, which is this one right up here at the top. If you see that cross with the four suns, showing Bakongo influence quilting the, the Congo cosmograms onto her quilts. Other African symbols were seen in Powers quilts. However, scholars suggest that the cross symbols may also be a West African cross, as West Africans also had crosses as symbols, but the meaning and use was different from the Bakongo people in Central Africa. Fawn influence in artistic style was seen in Powers quilts as well. Harriet Powers was born enslaved in Georgia in 1837, and scholars suggest that she may have been of Bakongo or Dahomean descent. It would be interesting to um, see whether or not her descendants have had their DNA test done to actually find out for sure. But down here at the, at the bottom, you see there is this symbol. There's, there's the Christ symbol. And then there is the sunset to the sunrise. Lots of interesting things if you ever take some time 
to study her out as an artist in a quilter. And this again is my favorite part. Who do as resistance? If I wanna keep you from the information that is going to cause you to rebel against oppression, then yeah, I'm gonna erase this. Yes, I'm gonna tell you it's evil. Yes, I'm gonna tell you it's demonic. Yes, I'm gonna tell you, you shouldn't look into it. But that's why we're looking into it, okay? Who do as resistance? Uh, we talked about cultural anthropologist, Tony Kale, but I wanted to share a little bit of piece about Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass, a former slave and abolitionist and author wrote in his autobiography that he sought spiritual assistance from an enslaved conjurer named Sandy Jenkins. Sandy told Douglass to follow him into the woods where they found a root that Sandy told Douglass to carry in his right pocket to prevent any white man from whipping him. Douglas carried the root on his right side instructed by Sandy and hoped the root would work when he returned to the plantation. The cruel slave breaker, Mr. Covey, told Douglas to do some work. But as Mr. Covey approached Douglas, Douglas had the strength and courage to resist him and defeated him after they fought. Covey never bothered Douglas again. In his autobiography, Douglas believed that the route that was given to him by Sandy prevented him from being whipped by Mr. Covey. Mm-hmm, 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 mm-hmm. Yes, hoodoo or conjure for African-Americans is a form of resistance against white supremacy. African-American conjurers were seen as a threat by white Americans because enslaved people went to free and enslaved conjurers to receive these types of charms for protection and even revenge against their enslavers. Enslaved black people used hoodoo to bring about justice on American plantations by even poisoning enslaved holders and conjuring death upon their oppressors. So again, depending on who is speaking and depending on who is talking, right? There's a conflict having going on right now that people are like, no, this is not a conflict. This is ethnic cleansing. So depending on who's telling the story and from what point of view and what frame of view, some people are going to say, mm, should they have done that? Should they have tried to resist? Whereas the oppressed are going to say, of course, we should have tried to resist, right? We've often heard these stories that Black people just went with the flow, right? That they just kind of sat back, that they didn't really fight back. They just kind of endured the pain and the struggle of enslavement. Well, that, of course, is told from whose point of view? Let's look at some more evidence. Who do as resistance? Known hoodoo spells date back to the era of slavery in the colonial history of the United States. A slave revolt broke out in 1712 in colonial New York with enslaved Africans revolting and setting fire to buildings in the downtown area. The leader of the revolt was a free African conjurer named Peter the Doctor who made a magical powder for the slaves to be rubbed on the body and clothes for their protection and empowerment. The Africans that revolted were the Akan people from Ghana. History suggests the powder made by Peter probably included some cemetery dirt to conjure the ancestors to provide spiritual militaristic support from these spirits as help during the slave revolt. The Congo people in Central Africa incorporate cemetery dirt into Mackenzie conjuring bags to activate it with ancestral spirits and during the slave trade, the Congo people were brought to colonial New York. Now we're gonna talk about uh, what is this cemetery dirt and what actually, what are they doing with it, right? The New York slave revolt of 1712 and others in the United States showed a blending of West and Central African spiritual practices among enslaved and free black people. Conjure bags, also called mojo bags, were used as a form of resistance against 
slavery. So let's look at some symbols and some items that are connected to hoodoo. The first one is the mojo bag. If you see here in the image, the mojo bag is derived from the West African grease grease bag. This is the origin of the mojo bag. Okay, so it's not just something, it's not a commercial product or it was not until Hoodoo became commercialized, but it was a West African bag. It was usually over here, it's usually a flannel bag containing one or more magical items. Now, again, when people say magical, <laughs> I gotta say, what are you what are you talking about? It was considered to be prayer in a bag. It was something that could be carried with or on the host body. Alternative American names for the mojo bag include grease grease bag, handbag, mojo bag, Toby, nation sack, conjure hand, lucky hand, conjure bag, juju bag, trick bag, root bag, and jomo. All right. So it depends on what's in the bag, what's it being used for, what what are the symbolic things inside of a bag? Because all of them are not magic bags and all of them are not charm bags. And I would dare to venture to say if you look at some of the things that people are doing in our culture, overall trinkets that people hold on to things that people carry and put into special bags they could easily be called mojo bags but we don't do that we don't call everything a mojo bag all right so mojo is containers they're bags they can be gourds they can be bottles they can be shells or any other container the making of mojo bags in hoodoo is a system of African-American, what they call occult magic. The creation of mojo bags is an esoteric system that involves sometimes housing spirits inside of bags, either for protection, healing or harm, or to consult with spirits. So again, we talked in part one, we talked about when someone says they're a conjurer, you need to be asking, what does that mean? What does that mean for you? Because a conjurer is not just consulting with spirits. It can be that, but it's not just that. Other times, mojo bags are created to manifest results in a person's life, such as good luck, money, or love. Mojo bag. Enslaved narratives also tell of hoodoo. Let's take a look at some of the enslaved narratives. In Alabama slave narratives, it was documented that former slaves used graveyard dirt. Here's why they were using graveyard dirt. Here's one reason. To escape from slavery on the Underground Railroad. So somebody says, oh, they're using graveyard dirt. They must they must be calling for the spirits of the dead. Here's why they were using it. Freedom seekers rubbed graveyard dirt on the bottom of their feet or put graveyard dirt in their tracks to prevent slave catchers' dogs from tracking their scent. Pretty smart. <laughs> Former slave Ruby Tart from Alabama said there was a conjurer who could hoodoo the dogs. An enslaved conjurer could conjure confusion in the slave catcher's dogs, which prevented whites from catching runaway slaves. No, they actually used some scientific principle there because the dog was trying to track their scent. <laughs> in other narratives, slaves made a jackball to know if an enslaved person would be whipped or not. They chewed and spit the juices of roots near their enslavers secretly to calm the emotions of the slaveholders, which prevented whippings. Now I've got to use my brain and say, what roots were they spitting? 
Were they spitting things that gave off a certain calming property to where that in, that slaveholder would not approach them? We don't know. Slaves relied on conjurers to prevent whippings and being sold further south. African-American conjurers were seen as a threat by white Americans because they went to them for protection and again, sometimes for revenge against the slaveholder. Because of the practice of hoodoo and their knowledge of herbs, their medicinal properties and their poisoning properties, they would go to them and hope to get something to get rid of their slaveholder. And that is the truth. Here's another one. A man named William Webb helped slaves on the plantation in Kentucky resist their oppressors with the use of mojo bags. Webb told the enslaved to gather some roots and put them in bags and march around the cab cabins several times and point the bags toward the master's house every morning. After the enslaved did what they were instructed by Webb, the slaveholder treated his enslaved better. Another enslaved African named Dinky, known as the enslaved by the enslaved as Dinky King of Voodoo's, and the gopher king or the goofer king on a plantation in St. Louis used goofer dust, which is that graveyard dirt. That's what is one of the names of it to resist a cruel overseer. Dinky was an enslaved man on a plantation who never worked like the others. He was feared and respected by black people and whites. Dinky was known to carry a dried snake skin frog and lizard and sprinkled goofer dust on himself and spoke to the spirit of the snake to wake up its spirit against the oppressor. Now Dinky, Dinky was on some stuff, wasn't he? <laughs> Henry Clay Bruce, who was a black abolitionist and writer, recorded his experience of the enslaved on a plantation in Virginia who had hired a conjurer to prevent slaveholders from selling them to plantations in the deep South. Lewis Hughes, an enslaved man who lived on plantations in Tennessee and Mississippi, had a mojo bag he carried to prevent slaveholders from whipping him. So what is goofer dust? The word goofer in goofer dust has Congo origins and comes from the Kakongo word kufwa, which means to die. In practice, it was often used to create illness in victims, such as swelling of legs or blindness. Recipes for making it varied, but primarily it included graveyard dirt and snakeskin. Other ingredients included ash, powdered sulfur, salt, powdered bones, powdered insect, chitin, dried manure, herbs, spices, and anvil dust, a fine black iron detritus found around a blacksmith's anvil. So you go from a, a basic principle of taking graveyard dirt to cover your tracks from being found as you're trying to escape to this dust. All right. Any questions, comments? None so far. All right, let me continue. According to the Bakongo people of Central Africa, graveyard dirt contains powerful energy. The dirt contains what they believe is the spirit of the person that's buried there. Bakongo enslaved brought this belief to the Americas in 1730. However, you can't just take dirt from a graveyard. Um, but if you go online today, you're going to see lots of commercialized versions of goofer dust all over the Internet. You can't just take dirt from a graveyard. It must be bought. This entails respect being paid to the deceased and offering them something in exchange for the earth near their grave. Often people would pour liquor or they would give something that they enjoyed in life 
In the 19th century, a typical payment was a silver dime. This is why you might see certain items left on graves. If you happen to visit a graveyard, you might see trinkets or dimes or um, maybe alcohol or a bottle of something left near a grave. There's a, That's an indication that somebody may have taken dirt from that grave. So back to that New York revolt. What was the antecedent to these people revolting in 1712 in New York? Because after all, New York having an enslaved revolt, people don't really talk about that when they talk about Nat Turner, right? After the seizure of, the New, ne of New Netherland at the time in 1667 and its incorporation into the province of New York, the rights of the free Negro social group there were gradually eroding. In 1702, the first of the New York slave codes were passed, which further limited the rights enjoyed by the African community in New York. Many of these legal rights, such as the right to own land and marry, were granted during the Dutch colonial period. On December 13, 1711, the New York City Common Council established the city's first slave market, i.e. current day Wall Street. So Wall Street slave market gets established there in 1711 for the sale and rental of enslaved Africans and Native Americans. And so people knew what time it was. <laughs> they knew what time it was. Okay. We had some rights. We could own land. Now y'all passing these codes. Now y'all setting up shop. Okay. 1711, you're setting up shop for sale and rental. By the early 1700s, about 20% of the population were enslaved Black people. The colonial government in New York restricted this group through several measures, requiring the enslaved to carry a pass if they were traveling more than a mile from home. Stop and frisk was changed. <laughs> discouraging marriage among them. Discouraging marriage among them. So don't tell me about love, marriage, and family discouraging marriage among them, prohibiting gatherings in groups of more than three persons, i.e. any more than three of y'all, somebody else has to show up or be in charge, and requiring them to sit in separate galleries at church services. A group of more than 20 enslaved Black people, the majority of whom were believed to be Cormoranti or Akan, gathered on the night of April 6, 1712, because they had had enough. And they set fire to a building on Maiden Lane near Broadway. While the white colonists tried to put out the fire, the enslaved Blacks, armed with guns, hatchets, and swords, attacked the whites and, they ran, and then ran off. Eight white people were killed and seven were wounded. All of the runaway slaves were captured almost immediately and returned to their owners. Now, as a result of this uprising of 23 total black enslaved who had killed a total of nine whites and injured another six before they were stopped, more than 70 black people were arrested and jailed. And of these, 27 of them were put on trial, 21 of them were convicted and executed, and six of them are reported to have committed suicide before the trial. The enslaved at this time worked as domestic servants in New York. They were artisans, they were dock workers, and they were skilled laborers. They lived near each other, making communication easy, and they often worked among free Black people. This was a situation that did not exist on most Southern plantations, so they could communicate and plan a conspiracy more easily than those among the plantations and on the plantations. After the revolt, the city and the colony passed more restrictive laws governing Black and Indian slaves. Governing Black and, and Indian enslaved. Slaves were not permitted to gather in groups of more than three. They were not permitted to carry firearms. Gambling was outlawed. Crimes of property damage, uh, intimate assault, and conspiracy to kill qualified for the death penalty. 
free blacks were still allowed to own land in New York. Blacksmiths and hoodoo. At the Kings Mill Plantation in Williamsburg, Virginia, enslaved blacksmiths created spoons that historians suggest have West African symbols carved into them that have that same spiritual cosmological meaning that we saw with the cosmogram. In Alexandria, Virginia, historians found a slave cabin, a wrought iron figure made by an enslaved blacksmith in the 18th century, which looked like Ogun statues made by blacksmiths in West Africa, Edo, Fon, Mande, and Yoruba people. West African blacksmiths enslaved in the United States were highly respected and feared by enslaved black people because they had the ability to forge weapons. Gabriel Prosser, which a lot of people are familiar with, was an African-American enslaved in Richmond, Virginia, and was a blacksmith. In 1800, Gabriel Prosser planned the slave revolt in Virginia. Historians assert that he became the leader of the planned rebellion because he was a blacksmith and slaves respected and feared them because of their ability to forge weapons and their connection to the spirit of iron. Prosser and other enslaved blacksmiths made weapons for the rebellion, but the revolt never happened because two slaves informed the authorities. There's always one or two. They were most likely given meritorious manumission in exchange for selling out the community. Paschal Beverly Randolph, very interesting gentleman. During the era of slavery, occultist Paschal Beverly Randolph began studying the occult and began to travel learning of the spiritual practices in Africa and Europe. Randolph was a mixed race free black man who wrote several books on the occult. In addition, he was also an abolitionist and spoke out against the practice of sla slavery in the South. After the American Civil War, Randolph educated freedmen in schools for former slaves called Freedmen's Bureau Schools in New Orleans, and Louis New Orleans, Louisiana, where he studied Louisiana voodoo and hoodoo in African-American communities. Now in his book called The Seership, he organized a spiritual organization called the Brotherhood of Ulysses in Tennessee. Through his travels, he documented the continued African traditions in hoodoo practice by African-Americans in the South. So he has still has one of the oldest and earlier records of documenting those practices. He documented two African-American men of Congo origin that used conjure practices against each other. The two conjure men came from a slave ship that docked in Mobile Bay in 1860 or 1861. So how does hoodoo begin to spread in the United States? Hoodoo begins to spread through the great migration. As African-Americans left the Delta during the great migration, they took the practice of hoodoo to other black communities in the North which is why you will see um, hoodoo in Chicago, hoodoo in Detroit. There's, there are pockets of ho uh, hoodoo practitioners in those areas. Right now, Baltimore is said to be one of the stronger populations that has hoodoo practices going on. Um, this gentleman here's name is Benjamin Rucker. He was known as the Black Herman and he provided hoodoo services for African-Americans in the North and the South when he traveled as a stage magician. He was born in Virginia in 1892. He learned stage magic and conjure from an African-American named Prince Herman. After Prince Herman's death, Rucker changed his name in honor of his teacher. Black Herman traveled between the North and the South, providing conjure services and just card readings, crafting health tonics, and other services. However, Jim Crow laws pushed Black Herman to Harlem, New York's Black community, where he owned and operated his own business and provided root work services to his clients. What was going on post-emancipation? 
Well, we know that the mobility of black people from the rural south to the more urban areas in the north is characterized by the items used in hoodoo. As they are moving to the north, a lot of the things that they would have been using for hoodoo in terms of plants and all of that, they aren't able to use because some of those things are not in the north. So it begins to change how hoodoo is practiced. However, <laughs> there were other people taking note of these things, right? So white pharmacists opened their shops in African-American communities and began to offer items both asked for by their customers, as well as things they themselves felt would be of use. Some African-Americans sold hoodoo products in the black community too, but it didn't go so well. We're going to talk about that. We might not get to it today. We might do it on part three. Reconstruction in Jim Crow era. For some African-Americans that practice root work, providing conjure services in the black community for African-Americans to obtain love or money or employment or in protection from the police was a way to help black people during the Jim Crow era. So black people could gain employment to support their families or for protection against the law. As black people traveled to Northern areas, hoodoo rituals were modified because there were not a lot of rural country areas to perform rituals in woods or near rivers as, as originally purposed. Therefore, African-Americans improvised their rituals inside their homes or secluded areas in the city. Herbs and roots needed were not gathered in nature but were bought in spiritual shops called botanicas. These shops near black neighborhoods sold botanicals and books used in modern hoodoo. And we are going to stop there. I think I did really good for time today. All right, when we come back for part three, we're gonna talk about what happens as a result of Hoodoo, how does it move from pre-enslavement? Why does it all of a sudden, you know, kind of take a turn? Why do we not hear so much about hoodoo anymore? What actually happened between this empowering practice that the ancestors were using to get themselves out of depression, oppression, suppression, right? They had these practices that they felt was helping to carry them to a place of freedom, post-emancipation, right? You have Reconstruction, you have Jim Crow, you have the Civil Rights Movement. What happens in between that? What is actually going on to where now, if you say hoodoo, people jump like they have seen a spider? <laughs> because clearly something happened, right? From a community understanding that this was a part of their practice of getting free. And having the courage to revolt against oppression, because that's what hoodoo was doing for them, to all of a sudden it's this scary thing that nobody wants to talk about. And we're gonna talk about that on part three. What exactly happened? What was going on in the United States to make such a radical shift in perspective of people about hoodoo? All right, that concludes what I wanted to share today. I don't wanna to jump um, too further into, um, I don't wanna continue because we are running out of time. But if you would like to come on and share your thoughts about what you have learned today, I am dropping my StreamYard link in. We've got about a good 10 to 15 minutes. So if you would like to come behind stage, I will bring you on and we will share. All right. So let me know if you want to hop on. The link is now in the comments. And while I'm waiting, 
let me go ahead and address my podcast audience podcast audience. If you are listening by Spotify or Google Play, I want to thank you for your time and attention today. This has been another episode of Daring Dialogues, and I've been your host today, Shante Charles. Again, light is the most daring opposition to darkness, so continue to go out and be light. Take care. All right. Do we have anybody that would like to join me? behind stage. There we go. All right, I see you, Pastor Ben. Um, Give me just one moment. I'm gonna adjust the screen so we can both be here. And uh, all right, can you hear me? I can hear you, can you hear me? I can, I can hear you perfectly. Welcome. Thank you. For some reason, I couldn't get in uh, when on the stream yard last week. I, I had the logo, but I'm mean, not the logo, but the app. But for some reason, it just wouldn't do. But I I re-downloaded it, and now here I am. Awesome. So, but but anyway, um, I we, I actually had this discussion last night on the Bible study last part of it anyway. Um, the difference between voodoo and hoodoo. Uh, and you know you will surprise be surprised no you wouldn't <laughs> you wouldn't but most many people would be surprised at how, how different they are uh, mm-hmm. you wouldn't be surprised how many people that think that they are the same mm-hmm. you know because they, they are two different things um so, but in the terminology and everything, you know, and like, like we actually started off discussing um, um, Yoruba, and and when I was studying that, the question was asked: Is it, somebody asked the question, is it older than Christianity? And my thing is, why does that matter? Mm-hmm. Part of the problem is, is that we, many of us, thinking that. Christianity is a white man's religion when it's really of the way which Christ started, who was a black man. Well, he didn't start it. It was started after him because these people were following his teaching. Uh, they were black people. Uh, so my thing is, is that people want to run away from Christianity and into African religions. Mm-hmm. Because to them, Christianity is not an African religion. And many African religions were around longer than Christianity. Okay. That makes sense since Christ wasn't uh, didn't come to die and rise and, and bring us back into into our you know right relationship with God from the beginning. To me, that to me that's common sense. There are many African religions that would be older than what we call Christianity. I think what it, I think part of the confusion is that people keep trying to separate Christianity from Africa. Yeah. When, if you understand geography, <laughs> you will understand that Christ is an African. Mm-hmm. He's not separate. It's not like a, a little, a little drop over here is Christ. And then all this other stuff is happening in Africa. If you think about your own present day, right? and how much our cultures mix and meld, why would you not think that that was happening back then? Uh If you, I mean, I'm just saying, if if you believe in, you know, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, right? They were in Africa. Uh If you believe in Moses, Moses was in Egypt, Uh in Africa, okay? So to me, when I look at something like the mosaic belief and people say, well, it must be fake or it must be false because I can find, you know, I can find comedic origin stories in Old Testament origin stories. I'm like, of course you can. (laughs) Uh I don't understand. Of course you can. Because where did they live? Thank you. Lived in Egypt. They came out of Egypt. So to me, 
it would be illogical for me to not find any evidence of Kemet and not find mm -hmm. any e evidence of um, Egyptian origin story in the story of the Israelites. Mm -hmm. That would not be historical because they were in the area. They were in the region for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So to me, that makes more sense that mm -hmm. you would see the origin stories of, e of Egypt somehow connected to what you find in scripture. That to me is not a contradiction. That to me confirms that yes, they were in Egypt. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for 400 okay, let's, years. Let's move, Somebody let's is going to pick up something from somewhere. <laughs> let's move this up to date. Okay. Our origin of our ancestors was Africa. We're now here in America and we've been Americanized. Mm -hmm. You know, We've taken on many many characteristics of the European. Mm -hmm. Does that mean we're white? Does that mean we're European? No. No. We've learned many of their ways. Many of them has actually picked up our some of our ways, mm -hmm. which is kind of weird because why are we searching after their ways when they love our ways? They love our heritage even though they'll put it down until we put it down and then they'll claim it. But still, that, that's a whole nother topic. But, <laughs> but I thank God for the white folks <laughs> that can stand up and say, listen, them black folks is it. See, we got everything from them. They're the best cookers. And we're and we're gonna talk, you know, we, we've got two more parts of this. We're gonna talk about how we were driven away from our own practices, and those practices have been repackaged. Mm -hmm. We're gonna some people are probably gonna be shocked at how much repackaging of your own ancestors' beliefs has gone down. Mm -hmm. That's now a billion dollar industry. But it came straight out of your ancestors. And that's what they did with Christianity. The same ancestors that. that they're telling you to fear. The same practices that they're marking as demonic. Okay. Um, again, when I saw this, the Congo Cosmogram, there was something powerful. There's something powerful about this ancient symbol being it is made it through the horrific part of the middle passage like if i got a necklace if i believed in jewelry like that oh this would be on my this this would be my necklace mm -hmm. because this is more indicative of number one i have congo a, as my genetics this would be more indicative of my ancestors belief than a cross with a dead person on it. Mm -hmm. This made it through the middle passage. You got to understand that. This made it through an unimaginable death. This made it through whippings and beatings and unalivings and lynchings and hiding out and trying to escape and planning revolts and it's still here. <laughs> uh -huh. Cue the organ. <laughs> Cue the organ. So and then I look at the other piece, I look at the fact that you know why do the why do the Congo or the Congolese, right? The Bantu speaking people, why do they accept? Because remember, they they converted to Christianity before colonization. Why do they accept this Christ unless they already understood who the Christ was? Uh -huh. Okay. If you trace Bantu speaking people, Bantu speaking people come from the Hebrew people. I was going to say that. 
So yeah. it's it's not like they're accepting something without understanding its mm -hmm. connections. They don't change their symbol, right? They don't change their symbology, but they understand him within the context of their own symbology. So I encourage people, go look this up. Go find it for yourself. It's called the Congo Cosmogram. And as they said, researchers found this all over everywhere. They found it on plantations. They found it in spaces where our enslaved ancestors were hiding out, trying to escape. They, sound, they found it punctured into the, into the floors of places. They found it on walls. They found it carved into items. This wasn't just on one plantation in one state. This was everywhere. So again, that goes back to something we talked about in a previous teaching about the fact that because they were doing shadow breeding as well. They were moving people from different spaces, different places, different tribes around, and they were intermingling too. So it wasn't just all Congolese over here, you know, all Igbo over here, right? They mm -hmm. were mixing because they didn't care. After a certain point, they were like, we're just trying to breed more property. Mm -hmm. We're trying to get the best for our book. Pun intended. <laughs> so they didn't care. They didn't no, care. They didn't. But what they were doing in the midst of their wickedness, this is why I want people to understand, in the midst of their wickedness, they were spreading. <laughs> they were spreading a cosmological system. Q's organ. <laughs> so mm -hmm. this is very, very powerful to me. I don't know how other people might feel hearing this, but it is very powerful um, to understand the layers in which our ancestors resisted and communicated with each other, right? Because people will always say, how were they communicating with each other? How did they know where to go? Because they had their own symbolism. They had their uh -huh. own iconography that when uh -huh. they couldn't speak, that when they couldn't speak, they communicated by symbol. When they were muzzled, they communicated by symbols. They didn't shut them up. Because that's what we were taught. We were taught that they stopped communicating. We were taught that they stopped speaking their language, right? That's what we were taught. But now we know the truth. Uh -huh. That our ancestors were even smarter than we gave them credit for. That part. So, and so I want people to, to leave today's lecture knowing that your ancestors was just as smart as you actually thought they were. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh Very my goodness. Smart. Just in smart, uh, outsmarting over to and over to and over to again. Mm -hmm. And we're here to be able to tell the story. We're here to be able to uh, hone in on the power of the symbol. And like I said, if there's any symbol that I would be creating, that I'd be like, hey, I need a medallion made. <laughs> it would be that. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, Pastor, uh, final final thoughts? Yeah, somebody tag, come again. Yeah, well, I was going to I was going to speak about how smart and intelligent they were, and we've been using symbols. Our ancestors have been using symbols for <laughs> thousands of years. Hello, hieroglyphs. And, 
<laughs> exactly. That's why I was Hello, Marion tablets. Hello, yeah. cuneiform. They know yeah. that, but yet they want to separate us from it. Mm -hmm. See, we're dumb. We're not intelligent. We're like animals. But yeah, everything y'all got, you got it from us. Yeah. Oh, well, okay. well we're going to dive into that a little bit more. Yeah. We'll dive into that a little bit more. Um, my podcast, the audio version of this podcast is at uh, anchor.fm. Let me see. Anchor.fm forward slash daring dialogues. You can also find me on Spotify. <clears throat> if you have Spotify or Google Play, it's Daring Dialogues. All right. I want to thank you all for your time and attention today. Thank you so much. I appreciate you coming in. If you're just coming in, please go back and watch the replay. Share this with someone who needs to know and understand their history. This is such, I'm telling you, this is such a, a rich history that we have. I'm excited about sharing part three next week. Same place, Tuesday, same time, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness. So continue to go out and be what? Light. Light. Take care, everyone. Be well. And most importantly, be light. <laughs>